going through the different ancestors of Christ, and the one we're going to focus on today is Rahab. So Joshua chapter 2, and Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, the men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I did not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan, as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that... As I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through one window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go your way. The men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath, That you have made us swear. And she said, According to your words, so be it. Then she set them away, and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua the son of Nun. And they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. I'll turn to chapter 6. So after Jericho was conquered and defeated, this happens. Joshua 6, starting at verse 22. But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young man who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron They put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent out to spy Jericho. 
So Rahab, in Matthew's genealogy, she's named specifically as somebody who is in the line of Christ. Of all the ancestors of Christ, Rahab is arguably one of the most unlikely of all of Christ's ancestors. She is one who is kind of surprising that would be in the line of Jesus the Messiah who would come later in our New Testament. Because first of all, she's Canaanite. She belongs to the people of this land that Israel is going to inherit and possess. And these people are not like any other people. Their religious ceremonies were very appalling, and they would draw Israel into false religion as the Old Testament would continue. So these, this, these are very religiously despicable people, and they are also very corruptible for the Israelites. And so God put them under what they called a ban. In other words, you need to drive them out entirely. You can't intermingle with them. Don't marry, intermarry with them. They are going to bring you to worship their false gods. So she is a Canaanite. She's one of those people that they are supposed to drive out. And not only is she a Canaanite, but she's a prostitute. Her very livelihood is ungodly. And if she was under Israelite law, under Israelite law, people who were prostitutes were stoned. So she is a Canaanite prostitute, and she is in the line of Christ. This is pretty, this is pretty surprising. When you're going through Matthew's genealogy, and you come to Rahab. Oh, Rahab. Wow. The genealogy goes, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab, a Canaanite prostitute. One of the ancestors of Christ. But even though she was a Canaanite prostitute, she, even though unlikely to be in the line of Christ, Rahab shows some incredible faith here. If you look at her story, as we just have, it's amazing the faith that she is showing. Of all the people in her city, she stands out of all of them. In verse 9 of chapter 2, she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Like, right away. She sees these, these two guys coming and she knows, okay, they're Israelites and God, their God has given this land to them. Like, right away, she recognized that. So, in verse 9, she recognized her incredibly fortified city was doomed. <clears throat> Here she's living in this, this fortress of a city with walls that are like four feet thick and very high. It is a very well fortified city. Did some digging into Jericho, the city. It's one of the oldest known cities in the world and not for no reason. It's very strategically located and so anybody who held that city would want to guard it as much as possible and they did. It's got an excellent climate for agriculture and horticulture. It's a great location for water. It was strategically located around the Jordan River there, and it was very wealthy. It talks about silver and gold were to go to the Lord here, and one of the people of Israel in uh, the next chapter would actually steal a richly orm ornamented robe. So it was a very wealthy city and a very well fortified city and Rahab realizes we're doomed uh, in spite of all the appearances you know we we are very economically stable and we have some great protection she looks around and says we're doomed because God has given this city to the Israelites 
And then verse 11, while the rest of the city feared, she believed. Everybody else was in fear, but she believed. In verse 11, she says, as soon as we heard of it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So everybody became afraid, but she wasn't just afraid, she also believed. When everybody else was in fear, she goes a little farther. She says, for your, the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. She makes kind of a statement of faith there, a, a confession of faith. And if you look at Deuteronomy, where Moses is speaking, Moses says almost the exact same thing. Moses says, Know therefore today and lay it on your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath there is no other. So Rahab is speaking the same way as Moses is even. And the original readers of Joshua would, would hear that phrase from her and be like, oh, Moses said that. She's got, she's got some strong faith here. So she believed. She wasn't just afraid. But looking at it from her angle here, she was a traitor to her people. She helped the enemy. She betrayed her whole people, her, her nation, her city, she betrayed them. She gave them up. She recognized the doom of this secure city, this wealthy city, and she betrayed it. She feared God more than her people. And she, because she feared God, she's kind of in this stuck spot. She could stick with her people and be doomed, or she could betray her people, her whole nation, and be saved with God. But in order to be saved, she had to betray her people. Can you imagine betraying your nation? Can you imagine selling secrets to the Soviets? I mean, can you imagine doing that? That's essentially what Rahab did. But she did it because she recognized what God was doing here and she wanted to be on the Lord's side instead of simply belong to her nation. And as fortified as that city was, it was not fortified enough to stop God. Just a little thought for us. This is going off script here. The United States is a very well fortified nation. We have the most advanced army in the world. We are also a very wealthy nation. Very wealthy. We ha our economy dominates the world. When our economy sneezes, the whole world reels. And we, as a nation, we would like to think that we're secure and we're set. But we need to always be on guard and to be humble and to be repentant because there is no nation or city that is beyond fall. Jericho wasn't, and we aren't either. We always need to be humble before the Lord because He can topple any nation, any empire, any city. She saved Rahab. <clears throat> she saved not only herself, but all who belonged to her. Pretty much... Anybody who was a part of her family, her, her clan even, I mean, it kind of sounds like there was a whole group of people who were with her here, but she saved them all, not just herself. What's weird is we don't, we don't know much about those other people, the rest of the people in her family, but she saved them because of her. And in chapter 6, what we just read, it's stated three times. The same four words in Hebrew are repeated three times in just a couple verses. So, 6.22, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her. And then the next verse, So the men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. 
And then in verse 25, Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. So there's this repeating emphasis here. And all who belonged to her. She didn't just save herself. She saved, she saved her whole family there. And Rahab is among God's people even now. In verse 25, it, it says that she lives among the Israelites even to this day. Now, that was probably written when Rahab was still alive, and this writer was saying, yeah, she's, she lives on this street at this address. She's still with us. But even though that was written a long time ago, that statement there is still true now as much as it was back then. Because God's people don't die in that sense. God's people are still alive. Jesus was talking to some people who didn't believe in any resurrection or life after death, called the Sadducees. And he said, haven't you even read a long time ago when God said to Moses from the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? That means he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. It's not I was the God of Abraham, as if Abraham was back then somewhere in history. No, he's still the God of Abraham. And Abraham is still alive. Rahab is still alive, even right now. And she lives among God's people to this day. I like the way one translation puts it. It says, she is still living in Israel even today. So this statement here is true now, just as much as she was when she was on this earth. She's still among God's people. Rahab reflects her descendant, Jesus. She foreshadows him. She points ahead to him. And her character reveals him. Look at the uh, screen here with me. And let's answer this together. Are all saved through Christ just as all were lost through Adam? No. Only those are saved who by true faith are grafted into Christ and accept all his blessings. So Rahab, Rahab was saved, but not all of Jericho was saved. She saved everyone in her family, but the nation, the city, still fell. Jesus, he came into this world, and he saw this incredibly secure world as doomed in sin. He comes into this world, becomes one of us, was born just like every one of us and grew up like every one of us. And when he started his ministry, he started preaching things that people didn't like, including that this world is doomed in sin. A couple of things he said here, John 8, 23 and 24, Jesus said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. In other words, you're all doomed. You need me. Or Matthew 24, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This world is doomed. It's fallen apart. It's going to be gone because of sin. So this world is falling apart. You need me. You need me. Rahab, she was a traitor to her people. She had to give up the secrets of her people and she had to basically join the side of the enemy. And Jesus, similarly, Jesus sees this incredibly secure world as doomed in sin on the cross. Jesus died the death of a traitor. Very few people were crucified. You had to be really bad to be crucified. You had to be exceptionally bad. You had to betray the state. You had to be an enemy of the state. And that's the death that Jesus died. He died as an enemy of Rome. So in John 19, when Jesus is on trial, 
this happens here. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Jesus claiming to be king meant that Caesar was not the true king. And he points that out to to Pilate there. John 7, verse 7, Jesus said this, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it that its works are evil. When Jesus comes into this world and basically says, okay, all of you guys, are you're all in sin, and you're all wrong, and you need me. I'm the only one. I'm your only hope here. And when people are told that they're entirely wrong and they're steeped in sin, they don't really like that. And so what we usually do to those people is we crucify them. That's human nature. Jesus died the death of a traitor. He didn't die just any death. And also, like Rahab, Jesus saves not only himself, but all who belong to him. In uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer one, what is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul and life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. If you belong to Christ then you are saved too. Jesus not only saved himself, but all who belong to him. So John 10, Jesus said this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus lays down his life for the sheep, all who belong to him. Romans 7, verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. And one more. Romans 5, 19. For as by one man's disobedience, that would be Adam, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. All who belong to him, we are made righteous simply because of his obedience. Rahab earned for herself a permanent place in Israel. She lives there to this day. Jesus earned for himself a permanent place at God's right hand where he continually intercedes for us. When we pray, we pray in Jesus' name as if we were sitting right next to the Father in heaven at His right hand. So when we pray to God, we pray from the vantage point of Jesus. And Jesus has a permanent place there because of what He has done for us. So there's some things that we can learn from Rahab. And one of these things is even Canaanite prostitutes can be part of God's people. True believers are known for their faith and their actions, not their past, not their ethnicity or race or anything like that. A true believer is known by their beliefs and how they live. Not what they've done before or who their parents are. So in Hebrews 11, it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Rahab's in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Only the great ones make it in that chapter. And she's there. Even a Canaanite prostitute. And she's not the only one who is pretty surprising to have faith. There's a Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus. You'll read about her in your Bible reading tracks this week. There's a man named Naaman who is healed in the Old Testament from leprosy. He was not a part of Israel, but he had some great faith. There was a Roman centurion, and there was a Samaritan who returned to thank Jesus after he had been healed, apart from the other nine who didn't. True believers, the Bible says, are known by their faith, and their actions, not who their parents are. Past sins are forgiven 
So what counts is the present faith and your life. Whatever you have done in your life, however bad it may have been, sins are forgiven. The Lord forgives your sins. We don't have to keep bringing them up. Those are cleansed. They're washed white as snow. There are some people who walk around with guilt over things they've done a long time ago, and they just carry that constantly. And the Bible says, no, let that go. Jesus paid the price for that. You do not have to carry that anymore. You don't have to be burdened by that. What counts for true believers is what you're doing right now and how you live right now, what you believe right now. So as a church, as God's people, we need to be ready to welcome even the most unlikely repentant sinners into the church. There should be nobody who is repenting of their sins and believes and is living a new life that we could not welcome here. Nobody. If we had, if we had a card-carrying member of ISIS living in this area and repenting and wanting to join our church, we should welcome that person as much as anyone else. doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. You can belong to God's people. If Canaanite prostitutes can belong to God's people, then anybody can. Anyone who repents and believes and lives a new life in Christ. Anybody's welcome. Doesn't matter what you've done. Another example would be the Apostle Paul himself. If you know the story of him, he was going after Christians, throwing them in jail, and beating them, among other things, even killing them in some cases. And when it was revealed to a certain Christian that this man... Paul was going to come to him. It was revealed to him in a vision, and this guy named Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. This guy's here to, to drag us all away and to kill us. You're telling me I should go meet him? There should be nobody who we can't welcome into God's people who are repentant. And to be true to God, we must be traitors to the values and ideals of this world. There's always a temptation for believers to want to just assimilate into this world, to be like everybody else, to do all the same things, to live like they do, adopt their beliefs, their values, and their ways of life, and even the ones that are kind of questionable, but we try to justify it. You know, well, it's, it's probably okay. God forgives me or whatever. But like Rahab here, there is a world here that is steeped in sin that is going to fall. And Jesus is our only salvation out of this. And in the Bible, there's some pretty strong things that are said about this world, and to this world, we need to be traitors to them. For example, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There's, there's two opposite forces and ways here. You're either on one side or you're on another. And as much as we would like to just be like everybody else, if you're on the Lord's side, you have to fall into the category of traitor to the ideals and values of this world. Jesus died a traitor. And when he said, take up your cross and follow me, we need to walk that road too. So 1 John 2, do not love the world or things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him pretty strong words. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. Whose side are you on? Whose side are we on? To 
follow the Lord, we have to be a traitor to this world. And if our ultimate allegiance is to Christ, we must be ready to break any other allegiance. We have to be ready to break it at any time. So Rahab may have been a solid citizen up until that point, but until if that point arrives, we have to be ready to break any other allegiance to follow Jesus, to walk in His ways. Are you going to be like Rahab when that moment comes? I want to encourage you to do so. This is the way of the Lord and the way of Christ. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God in heaven, Lord, you are a a God who has a different way than, than the ways of this world. It's easy to get caught up in the ways of this world and to to live like the rest of people and to think like the rest of people. But, but Lord, we pray that we would walk in the ways of Jesus as our Savior and our Lord and our King. And we pray that we would be like your servant Rahab, that we would welcome anyone who comes to you and repents. And Lord, that our ultimate allegiance would always be to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.